My job as a professional bass angler is uh, wear a lot of different hats, literally and figuratively, you know, from being a tournament guy, from uh, traveling around the country, fishing professionally on the Bass Pro Tour, to creating content for social media, YouTube, as well as just being a face for brands. You know, a lot of different elements go into being a professional angler. Especially catching fish? Catching fish absolutely helps. I'm Ott Defoe, professional bass angler. You heard that right, Defoe. Rounds with Depo, not Defo. Defo, defense, Depo, Ott Defoe. That's me. <laughs> I grew up in East Tennessee. Lived most of my life right in the Knoxville area, but for about the last five years, I've called Blaine, Tennessee home. Very, very quick turnaround before stage two happens here. Actually at home for me, I get to sleep in my own bed to fish part of this event on Douglas Lake, part of this event on Cherokee Lake, as long as I make it to the knockout and championship rounds. Anytime I'm preparing for a tournament, I'll, I'll have the boat in here, the truck in here. And you know, if I'm coming from a different event, I'm gonna unload stuff that I know I won't need for the next one. I'm gonna go through and take a lot of stuff out of the boat. It's also neat too when you go back through and you're like, oh, huh, that's the thing I was looking for. <laughs> I wonder how that got down there. I try not to just carry too much stuff along with me. I feel like it, that extra clutter just bogs down my mind. Those are all colors that are not ones I typically use a lot anyway. <laughs> Sad <laughs> land of the misfit lures. Yeah. This uh, organization system is Something that I did this year, I've never done that before. With this, I can open the rod box, boom, there's the bait I'm looking for. Open the pouch, flip, flip, flip real quick to the color that I'm looking for. You know, that time saved when you're fishing a tournament is that many more casts. If you save a minute, it's a couple casts that you're gonna get to make more that day. Given the time of year and everything, I expect a jerk bait to be a major player, a crank bait to be a major player, uh, and a single swim bait. Those are the three that I, I really see being the biggest player. Spinner bait could definitely be, um, you know, be a factor. Most of the tournaments that are won in this part of the country are won with bait fish imitating stuff. I'm not one of the guys who actually likes to tie a lot of baits on before I go somewhere. I just make sure that I have the stock of them that I need in the boat with me because I'm liable to tie on a copper shad and I get down there and I want to bring them. I don't really have the best way to keep these over here. It's really not like the greatest system, but it's something. It is a system. <laughs> I'll go through all my rods and make sure I've got the line I want on everything, make sure that I've got the assortment that I want. I will tie up leaders on spinning rods or, or on bait casters to make sure that I've got all my leaders prepped. But as long as my line is there and I've got the assortment of rods that I want in the boat, that's all I want to have done as far as that goes. This little small section of garage, it's a place where I've always enjoyed, you know, tinkering with baits and uh, especially crankbaits. That's kind of always been something that I have enjoyed working on and, and making crankbaits. I always felt like I had a little bit of an advantage anywhere I went, especially if it was a, a shallow crankbait bite, because I had stuff in my box that nobody else in the tournament had, because I'd made them. <laughs> it's a labor of love and something that I have done since I was a kid. And with Raffalo, this is where the OG line of baits really got its start. When I became uh, sponsored by Rapala in 2011, you know, I had mentioned to them how, how much I, I loved balsa wood baits and I actually had built some myself. You know, that was always something that I admired about Rapala was just the fact that they're known for their balsa wood crankbaits. And then they shipped me one back that is what I sent them. That was a really, really cool moment for this little redneck from East Tennessee. Trophies and those kind of things, those mean a lot. But uh, but yeah, to have a to have a bait like that that is what I made now hanging on the shelf in Bass Pro Shop, that's pretty cool. At the age of nine, I attended my first Bassmaster Classic and went to nine of those in a row. And going to that first one at that point in time, that was when I was like, I want to be a tournament fisherman. That that is what I want to do. Cool. And here, these are old trophies. That was a that was a tournament trophy my dad ran called Bait B A I T. My dad was always extremely supportive 
of me being a professional angler. I mean, look, when I said those words, he's like, that's what you're gonna be. And then some Everstar string series trophies up through here. Um, these were BFL and then uh, some other FLW and string series stuff. So Jenny and I got married and I knew I wanted to be a bass fisherman when we were dating and I had, I had told her this and she said, okay, I don't know what that means, okay. You know, I mean, neither one of us truly knew. At this point in time, work is paying the bills and fishing is paying for fishing. I didn't have any sponsorship at that point in time. I wasn't making anything from fishing. And then we get a call from FLW of, hey, we've had a spot come up on one of these teams and your name has been pitched and they would like to have you on this team. I mean, this was a very clear answer to our prayers. 2009, I was a professional angler. This was my source of income, there was nothing else. The first year, that I qualified for the Elite Series. I wanted to make the switch over because I wanted to fish the Classic. I had I had went to all those Classics as a kid and I wanted to fish in the Classic. That was for sure my best year that I had ever had to date. I think I had three top 10s in my rookie year on the Elite Series. Fish head to head against Edwin Evers and I won that event and won $100,000 on the Alabama River. But it was truly the first time I felt like this might actually work out. I mean, if you beat Edwin Evers head to head, you're probably gonna make it. <laughs> so here's where we film JOJ. This is kind of our set for that. Lights and all that good stuff. And they're all kind of in chronological order. My first open win in 14 Elite Series, a couple more opens. Of course, the classic down there, and then some MLF. Stage wins, a cup win. Been pretty crazy to look at that, going from 11 to 22 down there with that heavy hitters belt being the most recent. Uh, it's weird for me to look at it, honestly, because uh, we, we keep it covered up a lot. There was there was a number of years there. I had already fished professionally some, and my mom at some point I said, so when are you going to get a real job again? <laughs> I do have a real job now, as you could say, so. <laughs> 2019 started off with a bang. That was the year the Classic was here in Knoxville and uh, immediately following that, I, I could feel that something just wasn't right. I'd get out of breath, just not doing much of anything, just walk up the stairs at the house and man, I'd ha like have to stop and catch my breath and talk to a cardiologist the next day and they tell me that I have a torn mitral valve and uh, I'm gonna need heart surgery to fix this torn mitral valve. I'm very thankful that, that God had his hand on me and got us to a place where they were able to, to find out what it was very quickly to repair my heart and get me back good as new. You know, when you have stuff go on in your life that makes you wonder just how much longer you're gonna to get to live or to realize that it is temporary, it makes you enjoy and appreciate any, any moment you get together. That opportunity to be home with them and do anything together or do nothing together, this time I'll never get back. Normally, you've hopped in the truck, we drove six hours to the tournament destination, but thankfully for here, we were at my house and now 25 minutes later, we're at the lake. We're real, real close to, to what would be my, my favorite week of the year to fish in East Tennessee. The, this time of year, it's a pre-spawn deal. Given that we are fishing two bodies of water, we are given three days of practice, an additional day of practice for this event. Plan for today on Cherokee is to, uh, to see kind of where the bait fish are here, you know, especially on the lower and mid part of this lake. First thing I'm gonna look at is water temperature and water color. And that's gonna get me a, just, a, just an idea right out of the gate. Trying to graph some bait, see just how deep that the bait is at. This holler here had some bait in it. It truly didn't have as much as I thought it would. We got bright bluebird skies, no wind, pretty bad conditions for really trying to catch them. I'll spend some time just looking and checking different sections of the lake to see if I can develop a pattern. That's very dangerous. Sure. <laughs> Ever wonder how bass bites your bait and doesn't get hooked? Just like this. <laughs> my style of fishing, I guess, crankbait is my bread and butter. That's what I like to fish with is a crankbait. Just moving baits in general certainly are my, are my favorite. All right, a 
lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of bait. Solid bait right there from like 20 foot to the bottom. Well, that didn't take very long. Gets a little largemouth way out there, about a million miles deep. Not hardly a stud, but at least it's something. We've ran, ran all the way up the river, but a good current up here. And that was kind of what I was wanting to see was to come up and see just what this looked like with this amount of current. Just a little small mouth, but a small mouth nonetheless on my little jig. Fishing in current, your boat positioning a lot of times ends up being part of your presentation. In cooler water temperature like what I've got right here, I'm wanting to slow that bait down and slow that presentation down. I'm actually kind of washing a jig down the current, just throwing it straight in at the bank, but allowing the boat to drift downstream with the current. And I can hop that jig up, pull it up slightly over those rocks, and kind of set it back down, and it allows me to get hung less while fishing the bait on the bottom, making good bottom contact, and just fish it at the speed that I need to, given that the water's, you know, pretty cool, 48 or 50 degrees, so. I got one on a crankbait. I, by golly, caught one on a crankbait. But you don't even know how good that feels because that should be happening a lot. You would count for sure. That is a wrap for today. So put in a pretty full day and covered a lot of miles of Cherokee. About as far up as you're gonna go. As of now, I make knockout round. <laughs> Northbound we go. They, they ain't much worry about uh, stopping any time before I get way on up the river. That's pretty easy to tell. Both of these lakes are pretty good pattern lakes. So that's what I will be looking to try to find. Throughout the day, we will, just like Cherokee yesterday, we will cover the whole thing, top to bottom, try to get a good understanding of what these fish are doing and hopefully get a little, little bit of a bite figured out. I expect the day to be a little bit better. Plus, as, as well as it's, it's gonna warm up better today. And uh, I said we're supposed to have you know, maybe a five to 10 mile an hour breeze, which doesn't sound like much, but if it's enough to put a decent little ripple on the water, move the water around some, it, it should help. Got a fish, probably a little small mouth. If I were a betting man, yep. Little small right there off of that point. Making a top 10 to me is kind of the measure of success, you know, I mean, Sponsors are gonna look at that as a successful week as well. You got coverage out of the event for sure. That kind of checks all the boxes other than holding up a trophy, which is <laughs> the ultimate level of success, you know, obviously. Well, I'll be dadgum if I didn't finally catch something. My first scoreable bass on Douglas Lake. Did get me one finally. Man, I, I've not learned a lot, to be quite honest. I've caught two small fish, and I've caught two scoreable bass, but they were not big. Pretty disappointed in my day, to be quite honest. Dude, that fish absolutely thumped it. Oh, that's a really, really pretty small mouth. I don't know if it's four, but it's really close to it. That last one I caught was just, just fishing this little hair jig just, I mean, on a perfect little bluffy point. You know, pretty steep right against the bank, making a good eddy. All the things that you'd want it to do. Something I guess I've known for is that I like to fish barefoot. I like fishing barefoot because I just have a, have a good feel for where I'm at in the boat, I guess. I just feel like I'm a little bit more nimble moving throughout the boat. If I can fish barefoot, if it's above about 65 or 70 degrees, I'm probably gonna be barefoot in the boat. Got me one on tiny on a little secondary point here. It's a green gizzard. This water's pretty clean. The fish was on a perfect staging point going into this pocket right here. 
Something I always think is very valuable in practice is truly to look at all the water available, you know, just to get a feel for what all is available to you on that system at that point in time. That's another good chunk there. We may be starting to get us a little something figured out. The biggest thing was finding a section of the lake that has got the right conditions in it. I mean, we've caught two within like a quarter of a mile of each other. We're on them. Starting to get a little bit of confidence at this point that I at least can catch some. Now at least I have somewhere to go fishing. Day three practice, putting in back here at Dandridge again, and you can tell by the way I'm suited up, it is a very wet day. Gonna get the boat in the water and get out there and dive around in the rain. Uh, went to kind of a main lake point and I could see some fish and finally got one to bite on a jerk bait, a nice smallmouth, three, three and a half pounder. There's a few of them down there. The next thing that really worked for me in multiple different times throughout the day was getting back in flats, throwing a lipless crankbait, just kind of covering water. Um, caught a few white bass mixed in with some of those. And anytime you're doing that on this lake, there's a lot of food around, and those white bass and, and largemouth and smallmouth will all get right in the same places. That was pretty much my day. Was the lipless crankbait was a good bite, and then I did catch a couple on jerkbait. Truthfully, it was my best day. It was more productive, like I felt like I knew stuff I didn't need to fish at the end of the day, and I felt like I know stuff that I do need to fish at the end of the day. So I know the section of the lake I'm gonna fish. I know four or five or six baits I'm gonna throw. In a lot of ways, that's all I can ask for. We need a good start, kick this event off well, get us well on our way. Look at each tournament a lot the same. I try not to treat, you know, one a lot different from the next. It, it almost never fails that that first morning, I'm going to be nervous to catch the first one. I'm already thinking from the time I get up, where should I start? What's going to be my first cast? What bait am I going to start with? Thinking out every single possibility, checking the weather. I look at all that stuff morning of to try to get as much information as I possibly can to make the best decision to start the tournament off with. If you do terrible that first day, you can really make it hard on yourself. I've been practicing actually for this tournament since I was about nine years old in a lot of ways. We're here a little bit early. We've got fishing church this morning. It's a Sunday, so I'm going to kick the day off with that, and then we'll, uh, then we'll start competition shortly thereafter. So. As I'm leaving the ramp in the morning, the thing that's going through my mind is trying to make everybody else proud. I've got Jenny, I've got the kids, I want to make them proud. I've got mom and dad, I want to make them proud. You know, I've got a lot of people that are looking at me. Deep down for me, for that satisfaction, it's about knowing that I made them proud and they can say, that's my dad, that's my husband, that's my son. He's doing what he loves to do, he's doing what God has called him to do, and he's, he's doing it well. All in all, this week, this tournament, looking back at it, first day did not start off well over Douglas, only caught nine pounds. I knew I needed a better second day just to get out of Douglas and get to Cherokee, and had that day. I made it, made the decision, you know, up in the second period, went up the river and caught those fish up there just to be able to make it, you know, out of those qualifying rounds and on to, on to Cherokee Lake. First day of that knockout round, had a very good day, ended up, under a pound off of the lead. And I had made a move at the end of the day when I culled three times. I called a four pounder, a three pounder, and another heavy two pounder that helped me. I fully expected with five of us going out, having 16 pounds, given the weather for the championship day, that somebody that had caught 16 was gonna catch at least 17, possibly even 18, and that's the kind of value that I would need to win. 
I was absolutely right in that, except somebody that caught 16 actually caught 19. And that was Keith Poche. He did, a, did an amazing job. A successful week, no doubt about it. A top 10 finish here on Home Waters. All in all, a great week. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, I'll play Murray next.